So you've installed Linux. Congratulations. That is definitely an accomplishment to be proud of. I think that you have joined a fantastic number of people who have installed the best operating system on the planet. Now, I might be a little biased, of course, but I truly think that if you've taken the jump to switch to Linux full-time, you have accomplished something fantastic. But the question becomes, now what? You've installed Ubuntu, you've installed Arch Linux, you've installed Manjaro, Linux Mint, Fedora, whatever distribution you've chosen. The question becomes, once you've installed it, you've surpassed the hard part, what comes next? Well, after you're done patting yourself on the back, there are a few things that you should do, or at least learn how to do, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So today, I'm going to talk about the five things you should do after you've installed Linux for the very first time. So let's go ahead and jump in. The first thing you'll want to do, and this applies, and actually all of these apply no matter what distribution you've chosen. The first thing you will want to learn how to do is how to update your system. There are usually at least two ways for you to update your system, sometimes three, sometimes even more than that. Now that's one of the things you're going to have to get used to on Linux is that there's almost always, almost universally, there's more than one way to do something. And while that might frustrate some people, it does give you some options based on your level of skill. So if you are very used to Windows, chances are when you update Windows, it has popped up to tell you that there's an update and it does it for you. For the most part, that's not how Linux works. So you have to develop some skill in actually updating your Linux system. This doesn't mean that it's going to be hard, it's just going to be a little bit different. So for example, the vast majority of new users probably update their system through their GUI software center. So if you're using Ubuntu, you're going to be opening up software, clicking on the updates tab up, the, up at the top, and then clicking on update all or whatever it happens to be. That's the same on Fedora. For the most part, it looks pretty much the same if you're using GNOME, at least. If you're using a KDE-based distribution, chances are you're going to use Discover or something similar like that. If you're on Manjaro, they have their own tool called Pamac, which will do updates for you. And a lot of similar Arch-based distributions also use Pamac as well. So, again, how you do it is going to vary a little bit depending on what distribution you choose. So that's why I've said the first thing you should do is learn how to do that. And the easiest way to do that is to Google it. Get on Google and search for how to update blank distro. So if you're on Manjaro, how to update Manjaro. That will help you out and get you the instructions that you need in order to update your system. Now, one of the things that you're going to have to get over is get past the myth that is out there. And that myth is that you never have to restart your Linux system. Because you do have to restart your Linux system from time to time. And it's almost always after an update. Now, now where it differs from Windows is that Linux will never force you to restart your computer. You can do an update and then continue to use your computer for as long as you want. Weeks, months, years, whatever you want. What you'll have to know is that your updates, specifically the updates to things like the kernel, won't take effect until after you've rebooted, rebooted your system. So just know that you do have to reboot Linux from time to time in order if you want your updates to take effect. So that's just kind of a, a mini tip there for you. The next thing on the list of things to do after you've installed Linux is learn how to install applications. Now this is actually fairly similar to how you update your system. So if you are using Ubuntu or some other distribution that uses GNOME, you're going to probably use the software center to install software. And you can do that very easily. You don't have to worry about where that software comes from. Just open that application up, find the piece of software that you want and install it. Now, obviously, just like with Windows and Mac, there are other places you can get applications from. So you can get things from like Flathub or you can get things from uh, PPAs if you know what those things are. It doesn't really matter what they are now. Just know that if you can't find the piece of software that you want in the software center, do some Googling and you'll f probably find out that the piece of software that you want, or at least an alternative to the piece of software you want, is available somewhere for you to install. It's just a matter of learning how to install those things. So the easiest way, obviously, is through the software center, but you can learn how to do things through the terminal. So if you're using Ubuntu or an Ubuntu-based distribution, you'd use apt. If you're using Fedora, you'd use DNF or, Pac or Pac-Man if you're on Arch. 
So like I said in the first one, there are multiple ways of doing this and they are going to be different depending on what distribution you choose. But once you've used Linux for a small amount of time and you've probably floated between different distributions, you'll notice that there are some similarities. So while the syntax might be different, if you're installing something in a terminal, the process is almost usually identical, no matter what distribution you're on. There are obviously some exceptions to that, but just know that for the most part, installing software works basically the same across all distributions except for the specifics. So, you know, you use GNOME software if you're on a version of GNOME. You're going to use Discover if you're on KDE. You're going to use the terminal if you're more interested in using the terminal, things like that. Now, moving on to the third one. The third one is going to be a little bit more technical for the new user. And I have a video on how to do this if you're interested in being instructed on how to do this. But unlike Windows, Linux does not come with a firewall for the most part. There are some distributions that come with a firewall, but the vast majority of them do not. Now, the easiest firewall to install is UFW. It's called the Uncomplicated Firewall. It's very easy to install, very easy to set up, and usually just set up and forget. Like, it just, you turn it on, it turns on whenever you start your system, and you're done. You never have to even remember that you have it there. And that's very similar to what you'd expect in Windows, only Windows has one built in from the start. It's a GUI, and from time to time it's going to ask you if you want to let this thing through the firewall. And that's not going to be the same on Linux, but that's because it doesn't come with a firewall. So I highly recommend installing a firewall. It will just add that extra layer of protection to your computer. This is especially important if you are a avid internet browser. Let's just put it that way. Again, I have a video on how to install and manage UFW. I will link that in the video description below. The next one is probably the most important part of using a computer, no matter what operating system you're on. You need to develop a backup plan. And this is even more important on Linux, especially for new users, because when you are a new user, you're going to be messing around with stuff. You're going to be tweaking stuff and learning how to do stuff and just being a complete nerd when you, you know, turn on your computer in the morning and you're just going to say, this thing is new. I'm going to just, you know, discover as much about it as possible. The problem with that, and it's not really a problem, is that as you go through and do stuff that's new to you, you're going to mess things up. It's just a guarantee. You know, your audio is going to stop working. You know, you're, you're going to mess up an application. You're going to delete something that you weren't supposed to delete. It doesn't matter what that is. But the point is, is that eventually somewhere along the line, something's going to go wrong. You know, either an update's going to mess up or whatever. And that means that you're going to have to have a way to make sure that you don't lose any data whatsoever. Now, on Windows, there are multiple different ways to back up your system, just like there are on Linux. Some of those things are built into the system. So things like OneDrive are there on Windows, and you might use that, whatever. Uh, you can use that on Linux if you want. You can use OneDrive or Google Drive or... Uh, things like pCloud on Linux, whatever you want to do. Those clients do exist. Dropbox is here too. There are also open source alternatives for those things or open source applications that allow you to create your own local backup. So things like TimeShift exist. Now, for the most part, TimeShift has transitioned to doing Butterfest snapshots, but you don't need to know what that means. It also still has something called rsync built in, and that allows you to just to make basically make a copy of whatever you want to back up to whatever destination you want to back up, and it can be automated. That's what TimeShift does. There are other tools as well that allow you to do this. So again, I highly recommend hop on Google how to back up Linux or apps to back up Lin Linux perhaps and uh, find some options there for you to back up your data because that's very important because like I said, you are going to mess something up eventually. You don't want to be in a situation where you messed up your Linux distribution and that means you're going to lose all of your data. You don't want to do that. Now the last one on the list is more kind of highfalutin and I, I say this because it's not something that is necessary because I know a lot of people who use Linux and they never get involved in the community because they either don't want to or they expect they have to develop something or they have to start coding or they have to start growing a neck beard whatever it happens to be they don't want to be involved in the community that's perfectly fine and there's nothing wrong with that you can you're free to use linux however you want to use it but i think that you would be doing yourself a disservice by not getting involved in some way and 
that doesn't mean you have to go out and learn Python or C or Haskell. You can do those things if you want to, but you don't have to in order to be involved. And I'm not even saying that you have to contribute to the community. Just go to r slash Linux on Reddit and look through the posts and get involved in conversations. Go to the forums of your favorite distribution. Get involved by a answering questions or asking questions or just reading even. Just get involved in the community as much as you feel comfortable with. Because one of the greatest joys I've had of Linux isn't actually using Linux. And that's kind of saying something because I love using Linux. But one of the greatest things for me over the last five years since I switched to Linux full time is getting involved in the community. I've made so many friends through the Linux community and it's just been amazing. And even the people that I would, you know, can't really consider friends, just the average passers by, I have fantastic conversations with. And it just kind of makes the entire experience so much better. And it's not something that you really have an opportunity to do when you use Windows. It's kind of different with Mac because there is an Apple community. You're, everybody has, there has spent thousands of dollars on Apple equipment and stuff like that. And, and they, that kind of pulls them together into an Apple community and they can, you know, get involved in like YouTube video community, you know, like YouTubers communities and like blogs and stuff like that. For Windows, it's, Windows has become such a tool that there's not really a community there. Yes, there is, but it's more of like an IT community, if you, if you know what I mean. With Linux, the community is all over the place, and it doesn't matter whether or not you're a new user or not. You know, you can get involved and just get into a community and float around and, you know, have conversations with people who enjoy the same type of stuff that you do, and you'll just meet so many fantastic people. Yes, you'll meet a whole bunch of assholes, but that's the same as any community, right? It's just the nature of humans. When you put more than three of us together, one of those people is definitely going to be a dick. You know, that's just kind of the rule of nature. But for the most part, you're going to meet so many nice people, and it just kind of enhances the entire experience of using Linux. So those are the things that you should do after installing Linux for the first time. I think that those are the most important things, but they're not the only things. One of the pieces of advice that I always give to new users is that I really truly do think that you should not be afraid to break things. When you're brand new at Linux, one of the best things you can do is experiment. You know, that's why I put on the list of backing your stuff up, because if you try out new things and you break stuff, you are going to learn how to fix those things. That's part of the fun part of Linux is that, yeah, you're going to learn a whole bunch of new stuff just not breaking Linux. But when you try to try out new things and move from here to there and move to different distributions and try out, you know, different package managers and different audio interfaces and stuff like that, you know, you're going to experience problems. And part of the pleasure, at least from my point of view, of using Linux is trying to solve those things. And maybe that's not for everybody. You just want a tool that you can use that is stable and just works. That's fine. You're going to find that in Linux as well. You can use Ubuntu or Fedora or whatever, have that experience and never break it. But it when you do come up against a problem part of the fun part is at least for me is to learn how to fix it and you know maybe it's just because i'm a nerd you know the glasses and the neck beard you know kind of give it away but you know i think that that's one of the greatest things about linux is that you should just embrace the idea of learning this wonderful operating system that has so many facets to it so that is the end of this video. If you have comments about this, you can leave those in the comment section below. You can follow me on Twitter at the LinuxCast. You can follow me on Mastodon or any of my other social media networks. Those links will be in the video description. You can support me on Patreon like all of these fine people. You can do so at patreon.com slash the LinuxCast, of course. You can also hit that join button there below the video. That will allow you to support me here on YouTube if that's something that you're more interested in. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. I truly do appreciate it. I cannot begin to tell you how much it just makes me so happy that you guys find my content enjoyable enough to support me so thank you for watching thanks everybody for watching i'll see you next time